Welcome to section 3.3. We're going to cover basically the structure of DNA, how it's built, what it looks like, as well as DNA replication, which we'll normally just call replication, and it just means copying your DNA. So instead of having one set, you have two sets of DNA. Now, for starters, I want to go over the fact that DNA is made up of a bunch of monomers called nucleotides. And each nucleotide is going to contain a phosphate group. That's this guy with the P's and the O's. So that's a phosphate. It's going to have a five carbon sugar, they'll normally call it. This is the guy right here. This is our sugar. And it's going to have a nitrogen base. And the nitrogen base is going to be either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. There's four types. And they'll always be towards the center, like the connecting parts. Uh, and they'll either be two rings or one ring, although you always see that a double ring will always connect to a single ring. So there will always be this pattern of kind of three rings together. So let me just put in N base, N is just short for nitrogen. And a nucleotide is going to be one of each. So it's going to be a nitrogen base. Let me go through here. We've got our sugar and we have our phosphate. So phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. So this all together will be one nucleotide. And this picture itself has a nucleotide down here, a nucleotide here, and a nucleotide here. So all told, this picture is showing us four nucleotides. When you put a bunch of nucleotides together, you either get a nucleic acid, it can be called, or a polynucleotide. If I use either of those terms, don't freak out. It just means a bunch of nucleotides connected, DNA being one example of that. So that's kind of our quick rehash. So going on, as once we figured out that DNA was the genetic material, People were trying to figure out what DNA looked like, how it worked to store information. So Shargaff was one of the first guys that started looking at this, and he noticed that the amount of adenine in a particular species or organism equaled roughly the amount of thymine. And then the amount of cytosine, so that's another type of nucleotide with a different nitrogen base, equaled the amount of guanine. So for instance, if you have 15% adenine, you had an equal amount of thymine, which would be also 15%. They're equal. And then now that means we've accounted for 30% of our total nucleotides. So there's 70% left. And because C has to equal G, you just take 70 divided by 2 because you have half of each. So in this case, 70 divided by 2 is going to be 35. So I'd have 35% cytosine and 35% guanine. So these ratios and this, this connection between adenine and thymine and this connection in amount of cytosine and guanine was something that we were aware of before we figured out the structure of DNA. So it was one of the evidences that we used to try to figure out how DNA is assembled. We knew kind of its pieces, but we didn't know how to put those pieces together to make a DNA. So Shargaff was one of the first evidences that we had that gave us clues. Now later, we had a lady named Rosalind Franklin who came up with these X-ray pictures. They're called X-ray crystallography. And they gave us this weird, fuzzy, black and white image that doesn't look like DNA. But it allows you to build a model of what DNA might look like, then calculate what the X-ray crystallography image would look like if that's what DNA was, and check your work. So you know the answer, but you still have to solve the problem to check and see if your answer is right. And so Watson and Crick were two scientists that used this data from Rosalind Franklin to allow them to build different models until they eventually discovered the double helix, which is the shape and the structure of DNA that we now know. And they were able to use her data to prove that they were correct. And so the idea of a double helix is the twisted ladder. So you've got two separate strands, polynucleotide chains, so these are two different strands. So each of these bars, you can see the blue, the pink, each of these is a nitrogen base, and the sugars and the phosphates are along the edge here. So when you see this kind of beige color, that's going to be the sugars plus the phosphates. And we oftentimes call that the backbone of DNA. Okay, So that's like the sides. These are all covalently bonded strongly. So these are all covalent bonds. So the nitrogen base is the middle guy. And that's also covalently bonded to the edge. So this is very, very strong. So imagine it's a ladder, and the sides of the ladder is strongly bonded to part of the rung. Now, the weak part of this is where the two chains, because we've got the one chain here, you can see that one kind of cruising around, and then we've got the second chain, which in this case, let me see if I can make it show up if I try a different color. So we've got the second chain that's also spinning, and it's this middle part where it's weakest, 
because in this middle part where the two nitrogen bases kind of get close to each other, those are just going to be hydrogen bonds. So those are held together more weakly. So it's kind of like you have a ladder that literally comes in halves. So it looks kind of like this. And then you put up another side of the ladder, but in the middle they just like Velcro. You know, it's not like a strong, strong, strong connection. It sticks, but it's not as durable. This is the double helix, except in this case the ladder's not just straight vertical, the ladder's twisting as it goes. So it's more like a spiral staircase versus just a regular old staircase or ladder. So this is what Watson and Crick discovered and were able to demonstrate was correct. The sugars and phosphates are kind of on the outside, and the nitrogen bases are on the inside, and they're the ones that like connect to each other through these hydrogen bonds. So to show you again a, a picture to kind of illustrate this, this one's unwound, so this would normally be twisting, but we're just bending it back, if you will, to look at it. And so you can see this will be the uh, phosphate sugar. This is the backbone. So this will be, well, let me get a better color here. So this would be essentially, if we were drawing this, we'd kind of just draw this usually as more of a straight line to represent that it's just like the backbone. I, I'm terrible at drawing, so deal with it. And then it's the middle part that we tend to care about most. These are the rung pieces, the steps, whatever you want to consider them. They're the ones sticking in the center. And you can see they don't like touch, but they get close to each other and there's these dotted lines and these dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds. So H bonds, H for hydrogen. All the other bonds, all of these, these, all the other bonds that we've talked about will be covalent. So all this side stuff, everything else is covalent strong bonds. If DNA is going to break, it's typically going to break straight down the center because it's the center that's the weakest point. So if you've got a ladder, it's like the ladder is most likely if it splits to just kind of split down the middle and you have two half pieces of the ladder uh, that really aren't going to be very useful potentially because I don't know if you want to climb on that if it just has partial pieces of steps sticking out. Uh, but in our case, it's kind of important that when we split DNA, it splits down the center. This will be a critical piece in the next step we're going to talk about, which is replication. You'll also notice that these hydrogen bonds are different. This one's adenine this one's thymine, so A and T. You'll notice they form two hydrogen bonds, and the direction of those hydrogen bonds are different than that between uh, cytosine and guanine. You'll see guanine and cytosines are kind of more downward facing, whereas these ones are more upward. And this is critical because there's a complementary pair is what they call it. So adenine, just like Shargaff figured out, wants to hydrogen bond with thymine. They want to pair up. Cytosine wants to pair up with guanine because they line up perfectly to attract each other. So it's like magnets where when they line up, they're opposite poles, so they want to draw closer. They want to kind of stick. Whereas if I put adenine with anybody other than thymine, they don't match up properly, so you can think of it as being like repelling, like when you take magnets and put the same pole beside each other, and so they push apart. This will be critical because when we're copying DNA, it's important that adenine only wants to pair up with thymine. It makes it a heck of a lot easier to copy our DNA if you can essentially rebuild the second half of DNA as long as you have the first. Because if my first part of DNA says A, C, A, G, T, the second half, this adenine, only wants to pair up with a thymine nucleotide. I'm going to ignore the sugar and phosphates and be off to the side here. Cytosine only wants to pair up with guanine. Adenine only wants to pair up with thymine, etc. Until eventually we can pair them up with their complementary partner, and we now have a brand new, fully complete, identical copy of the DNA we started with. So this will be critical during the process of replication, which is just copying. If you want to reproduce at some point, you have to have two copies of your DNA, because one cell is going to split and become two new cells. And each of these new cells has to have a copy of the DNA or else they can't survive. So we at some point have to take our one copy of DNA and make it two so that each new cell has its own copy. That's why we have to do this. Now when we do this, the process will be, I'm going to do a very straightforward simple version of this. We're going to take our DNA, this is our double helix, and we're going to have an enzyme called DNA helicase that's going to essentially go up and split this DNA double helix. So it's going to go up and unzip it by splitting those hydrogen bonds that are holding it together in the center. And so that lets me peel apart these polynucleotide chains. And then another enzyme, DNA polymerase, 
polymer, building a polymer, so it's sticking things together, is going to come in and bind the complementary nucleotide to rebuild the new strands. So you're going to see each original strand, these are our originals on the sides here, so each original will now be fitted with new nucleotides, okay, the complementary nucleotides, so each single strand that we split will now become its own brand new double helix that's an identical copy of the next one. So when this process is done and we unzip this whole thing and we fit in the new bases, we'll now have two brand new double helixes that perfectly match. And then we can give one of those to each of the offspring when we go through this process of reproduction. Now, you might see this term semi-conservative when we talk about replication. And what that means is when I rebuild my new strands, let's say this is my old strand. I'm just going to draw these two strands. They're connected. Okay, They're red for old. When I rebuild this, what's going to happen is I'm going to get where each of my copies will consist of one old strand, that's from the original, and then one new one. And I'm just going to put blue in the middle because I'm lazy. And so this is what's called semi-conservative because we have the red one is the old strand. Okay, that's from the original DNA molecule. And then the blue one is going to be the one that we newly built, so the new strand. So conserve means to keep. Semi-conserves mean we, we kept one of the original strands, but not both. If it was fully conservative, that would mean that when we finished replication, one of the DNA molecules would be all red still. It'd still be all the old nucleotides, not half. That's not what we see when we actually look at this process. The one strand splits in two, unzips, separates, and then we just fill in with new nucleotides, the complements. So now this is a full, complete strand. This one has the same thing happen, so it's a full, complete strand. So I can now say each of the cells I'm about to produce gets their own copy. At that point, uh, reproduction can occur safely. We get all the DNA that we need, so each cell can continue to live and do the same functions it's always done, and life is good. Take it easy, guys.